Hi gang, Mr. G here with the second video I've made for our youth steel band members. Um, all subscribers to our YouTube channel are welcome to view these videos, and um, this one may be of particular uh, interest to a broader audience. This is recorded on Thursday, March 19th, 2020, during the coronavirus shutdown. Um, I've decided this is a good time for me to experiment with uh, growing out a temporary beard. It's been several years since I had one. Um, so in each video over the course of the next two or three weeks, you'll see me look older and older uh, as my white beard fills in. I, at least I think it's going to be white. It, it'll at least be salt and pepper, but um, we'll see how that goes. Well, I hate to tell you this, but you're not just pan players. You're also pan ambassadors with the added responsibility of representing a relatively new and sometimes misunderstood musical instrument. You need to have some basic knowledge so that you can answer the most common questions people will ask you about the instrument. Where it came from, how it came to be, the people who invented it. It's also important to honor these people who invented the instrument by knowing something about them. One of them was a personal friend of mine, which is one reason why I think it's important for you to know the story. Well, before we launch into this, I need to give credit to two friends who know tons about this stuff, uh, who have helped me fill in some gaps in my own knowledge about this. Dr. Shannon Dudley has been a good friend of mine for a quarter century or more and um, is a professor of ethnomusicology at University of Washington. He plays steel pan and has performed hundreds of times with me. Um, and he is regarded as one of the foremost experts on the history of the steel pan uh, out there today. Um, He's written many articles and books about it, and, and this one in particular is um, music, called Music from Behind the Bridge, is my go-to reference on the subject. You'll get a chance to meet him personally, eventually, either at one of our concerts or at the Youth Steel Band Summit, because he's, he's, he lives here in Seattle, and, and he'll be around. Dr. Kim Johnson lives in Trinidad and is the other well-known historian on the subject, he has been an acquaintance of mine since I lived there briefly in 2004 uh, and has supported my own research on the topic by providing me with information and some really cool media that I've included in this video. His illustrated story of Pan is another great resource. There are other online sources I've collected photos and audio from, too numerous to list here, but my thanks to them for allowing me to use these resources in this video which is intended for a pretty small audience. So, here we go. Steel pan comes from the island of Trinidad, a small country just seven miles off the coast of Venezuela in South America. Trinidad is considered the southernmost Caribbean island. It was discovered by Christopher Columbus on his third voyage to the New World in 1498. He gave the island its name, which is Spanish for Trinity, as in the Holy Trinity, when, as approaching the island, he first saw only the tops of three mountains. Trinidad is a melting pot of many cultures, and here is how that happened. Colonists from Spain came to Trinidad a few years after Columbus's arrival there. They brought with them diseases that virtually wiped out all the indigenous tribes. The Carib people, as in Caribbean, and the Arawak people, descended largely from other peoples native to Venezuela. Spain also brought slaves from Africa, as well as enslaving other local indigenous peoples to, to work at pearl fisheries and later sugar plantations, which would eventually become the major industry there. The African slaves brought their traditions of drumming, dancing, and singing, which they did for religious and recreational purposes. <laughs> Between 1791 and 1804, in another Caribbean country colonized by France called Haiti, the slaves there rose up in what became known as the Haiti Revolution, which was the most successful slave revolt that ever happened anywhere. The French masters fled the island, and many of them found their way to Trinidad, bringing with them an important French tradition called Carnival. In the United States, we know Carnival as Mardi Gras, which in French, translates to Fat Tuesday. Mardi means Tuesday and Gras means fat. Mardi Gras or Carnival happens right before the Christian period of Lent, a time of self-sacrifice that leads up to Easter. So 
Carnival is your last chance to eat a lot and indulge in all the fun stuff that you will deprive yourself of during the 40 days of Lent. In 1797, the British sent a fleet to invade Trinidad to take it over from Spain. Not wanting a bloody war, Spain turned over the colony of Trinidad to England as a part of the treaty. Trinidad then became a British colony. The British government formally abolished slavery in 1838, and in order to keep the plantations and other industries going, they brought in indentured servants from another country they had colonized, India. Indentured servants weren't slaves, but they were contract workers who weren't necessarily working in the best conditions or, or being treated very well or very fairly. Indo-Trinidadians and Afro-Trinidadians, that means people f originally from India or Africa brought to Trinidad, now each make up about 40% of Trinidad's population. The British government was represented in Trinidad by an English governor who ran the government in Trinidad. Most of the ruling upper-class British in Trinidad were uncomfortable with the public display of African culture on their streets, especially during Carnival. The drumming was sometimes noisy and viewed as a nuisance. One of the things that the drumming was used for was to accompany Kalinda, a traditional African stick-fighting martial art, where two guys with sticks try to land a blow to their opponent's head and draw blood. Yeah, I know, pretty violent. Really, they should have consulted the NFL about getting some helmets. I'm joking. Anyway, the British ruling class had kind of tolerated the drumming for a time, but the police would often harass Kalinda fighters and drummers, breaking up the matches. Feeling culturally oppressed, eventually the tension exploded in the Canboulet riots of 1881 in the capital city of Port of Spain, and again in 1884 in its second largest city, San Fernando. By the way, for those of you who play Samba de Sando, Sando is the local name for San Fernando. There were Kalinda fights happening in the streets in these cities as part of larger festivities, and the police came in in force to break them up. But instead of dispersing, this time the fighters banded together and fought back against the police. Riots ensued, many people were hurt, and there were deaths. You know, here in the US, some groups reenact battles of our Civil War. In Trinidad, they reenact the Cambulay riots. Well, when the dust settled, the British governors banned most forms of skin drumming in public places. But African tradition does not die easily. In an act of creative and technically legal defiance, the Africans replaced the skin drums with bamboo shafts. Large diameter shafts could be held upright and beaten against the ground to create a kind of bass line or boom. Smaller shafts of bamboo could be held in the hand and struck with a stick for a middle voice called fule. And for high frequency sounds, they took a long narrow shaft and cracked it along its length so that when struck with a stick, it had a sharp whack sound. These were called cutters. These instruments replaced what had been skin drums that served the same musical purpose. This type of band was known as tambu bamboo. There are a few groups in Trinidad that still keep the art form alive. Well, Trinidadians are a very competitive people, so one Tambu Bamboo band would always try to outplay or be louder than the other Tambu Bamboo band playing across the street. One of the bands recognized that metal objects, which had become more readily available by then, were a lot louder than bamboo, and so they replaced their bamboo with cookie tins, metal barrels, brake drums off of cars, um, bottle and spoon, anything that could function in the place of the boom, fule, and cutter and would be louder. And here is a very early recording of what that sounded like. Well, 
Within a short time, virtually all of the Tambu Bamboo bands had converted to metal. The irony here is that these groups were probably a lot louder than the skin drums had been. A man named Winston Spree Simon was a player in one of these bands. He loaned his boom to a very large muscular friend who played his boom too aggressively, leaving a big dent in the metal. Well, Spree was upset, but he noticed that on one side of the dent, it was one pitch, and on the other side of the dent, there was a higher pitch, a different pitch. He got the idea to try to create musical pitches by denting the metal. The first instruments would have had maybe four or five notes capable of playing very simple melodies and with a very crude sound. Well, in the early 1900s, Trinidad discovered that like its neighbor Venezuela, it was sitting on top of lots of oil and natural gas. As a friend of the United States, Trinidad was one of the places that American naval ships would refuel while patrolling the Atlantic Ocean during World War II. Ships would dock and unload all of their empty oil barrels and then take on full oil barrels that had been filled with Trinidadian fuel. Our next character, and a friend of mine since 1982 until his death in 2018, Ellie Manette, is widely created as being the first to apply Spree Simon's note tuning technique to an oil barrel. The larger surface area allowed space for more notes, which allowed for more sophisticated melodies to be played. Ellie also had the idea to create lower ranged instruments like our doubles, triples, and basses to create a full orchestra. Note here that in a traditional steel band arrangement, we have replaced the cutter with melody, the foulée with mid-range chords, and the boom with a bass line. There is a direct line between the original texture of skin drumming and tambu bamboo and into the steel band. Only now, the music is tonal and harmonic and melodic. Most people who played in the early steel bands were rough young men, and the early steel bands were seen as gangs. These bands were highly competitive, and sometimes there were acts of vandalism or theft of another band's instruments, or fights between band members. For example, one of Ellie's early pans, of which he was very proud, was stolen by a rival band, and Ellie found it hanging in a tree several days later. You can see why the upper class in Trinidad viewed the steel bands as a bad element of society. But in 1946, Spree Simon had the chance to perform songs on his steel pan for an audience that included the British governor. One of the songs he chose to perform was God Save the King, the national anthem. The governor was so pleased and amazed, he assembled the most talented and skilled pan men from various bands to go to England to perform at the Festival of Britain in 1951. This group was known as TASPO, the Trinidad All Steel Percussion Orchestra. Spree Simon and Ellie Manette were two of its members. When they set up their oil barrels to perform, a crowd gathered and at first laughed and giggled at how untidy and ragtag the group looked. But as soon as they started playing, the crowd was amazed. Steel Pan had just become a proud symbol of Trinidad. Today, the image of the Steel Pan is on the back of the Trinidad $20 bill, and steel pan imagery can be found in places like the logo of the largest grocery store chain and previously on the tails of the national airline. In 1962, England granted Trinidad its independence, giving it self-rule and its own government. One of the first things the new government did was organize a national competition for all the steel bands on the island. It was called the Panorama National Steel Band Championship. That competition still takes place right before Carnival, which is also still happening, and yours truly here played in the winning band in 2004, the 120 player Exodus Steel Orchestra. Here's the headline of the newspaper the next morning Panorama is live streamed on the internet and is covered in Trinidad like a sporting event with play by play analysis from a panel of steel band experts. You can also go on YouTube and search Trinidad Panorama and see hundreds of current and historical Panorama performances. But Back to the 1960s and 70s for the last part of our story for a second. There's one more guy you should know. He came along later when I was, well, your age. Uh, his name was Bertie Marshall. Before Bertie's contribution, the pan sounded kind of thuddy and very percussive. Here's an example. <laughs>
Bertie Marshall refined the way that the instruments were tuned, tuning harmonics into each note so that there was sustain and a prettier sound that could blend better. And the modern steel orchestra was born. The steel pan is the only lasting acoustic Western musical instrument invented in the 20th century. All of the other major musical instrument inventions in that century need electricity to be heard. And that's the kind of short story of how the steel pan came to be. There's no other instrument with a history like the steel pans. What's that? Will this be on the test? Well, there's no test except that as we perform more and more, people around you will begin to ask you questions. And armed with some background on the instrument's history, you'll come across pretty darn smart. And you'll do right by the instrument and the men who invented it and the culture where it came from. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you have questions or comments about any of this, leave them down there in the comments and I'll see them and I'll answer them. The next couple of videos will be about a video you can make to help support Steel Magic Northwest and about how a song becomes a steel band arrangement so that when you suggest a song to me, you'll know something about the process I go through in order to create the final product. I'll see you next time. Ciao.